Thank you for watching our online service. At Cedar Grove Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to become passionate followers of Jesus Christ in their community and around the world to the glory of God. And the key to it all is the glory of God. This service today is presented to you as an opportunity for you to draw near to God. And we know what glorifies God the most, and that is when we love Him with our heart and our mind and our soul. So we pray that this service will be that very thing that will help you to accomplish that end today. To love God with your heart, mind, and soul, and in the end, glorify Him to the fullest. Thank you for watching. Started. This is Psalm chapter 18. It says this, The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock. Exalted be the God of my salvation, who rescued me from my enemies. He exalted me above those who rose against me, and He delivered me. For this... I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing to your name. We gather and we sing in this place to lift high the name of Jesus because he's offered us hope and rescue and freedom. So let's just lift our voices together today. songs. Amen. We're going to continue in worship this morning, just singing, uh, singing out this familiar carol, Hark the Herald and Angels Sing. Let's sing this out.
Years ago, when we started uh, observing Advent, um, we did so as a focused reminder, and getting us ready for uh, for, the, for the birth of Jesus. Uh, it's not that we can overlook the fact that Jesus was born, but it's the fact that we get too busy with so much other stuff in our life. All of us in this room get busy. But Advent is the time to slow down and just ponder the beauty, the majesty, and the coming of the Lord Jesus. Last week we talked about hope. Today we talk about love. Um, the Jemison family is going to make their way up. Along with them, uh, Jean and Diane McLaughlin is going to join them up here. In just a few moments after, during the Advent, we're going to do so in memory of. And each one of these families have someone there. This candle is going to be lit in memory of today. given his most precious gift, his only son. May we not grow weary and tired of hearing this familiar verse from the Gospel of John. For God so loved the world, he gave us his one and only son. For those that believe in him shall not perish but live eternal life. John 3:16. Christmas is a time we when we celebrate God's love for us, but it's also an opportunity for us to share God's love with others. In the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, it says, A new command I give you. I give you love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Today's candle will be lit in the memory of my wife's brother, my brother-in-law, which was more like a brother to me, Frankie Bertishaw Jr., which passed away this past Thursday. And also, Bam's mom, Juanita Bertishaw, which was again more like a mother to me than a mother-in-law, and a sweet, sweet lady that I just loved so dearly in this church, and she loved this church. This was her church family. This church loved her, and I can, I was telling Brother Billy the other day, I just cannot bring it to myself to delete her phone number out of my phone, Miss Louise Spearman, which was just a 
every time you've seen her, you just seen the love of God shine through her. But the most important thing about love to me is to really know love is to know God and to have God in your heart and turn your life over to him. I just pray that if there's anyone in here that does not know that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior, please let today be the day before it's too late. Because there's a picture, going to be a picture, if it hadn't already been, of my brother-in-law up there. That Thanksgiving day, he was fine. Great smile on his face. So we never know. We're not guaranteed to, to get out of this service today. So please, it's almost like begging. Don't let the day pass if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And also, please don't let a day pass by. The last thing that man told me, my brother-in-law, was last Thursday at our house that, when that picture was made. He hugged me and said, I love you, brother. And this would be hard to get up here and talk if I did not know where these three people are today. And that's such a, just unbelievably knowing that they are in the presence of God. And we've all got that opportunity and it's a free gift. It don't, it costs Jesus Christ his only son to, for us. But today, if there's anybody that needs to tell somebody, hey, I love you, Please don't let the day go by. If it's a phone call you need to make, if it's somebody on one aisle that you need to, and just think how this world would be if there's two simple words that this country, uh, people would say, because this country's in a mess. I'm sorry, I was wrong, and I love you. Billy had asked me to say some things about my mother and the things that she loved. My mother loved the Lord with all her heart. She loved this church. You were her family. She loved the ladies that were in her Sunday school class. She loved all of the cards and the calls that she got when she was ill. She loved Virginia Sharp for bringing her a bulletin and leaving it in her mailbox when she wasn't able to attend so she could see what all was going on up there. She loved Jean Palmer, Florence Jones, Gail Smith. They always were so faithful to send her cards. She loved Janet Walker like she was her sister rather than her cousin. She loved Pat Russell and Meredith and their, her children just like they were members of our family. Mother loved the information line too so that she could see who all was on the prayer list. And she loved Billy Abrams dearly. She used to tell me that she wished Billy was her son. I said, well, I wish Billy was my brother, but we're just gonna wish our lives away. <laughs> she loved her community. And years ago, she was kin to everybody in it. I can remember when I was a little girl growing up in the church over in the old sanctuary, and it was like a family church. We were all related. She wasn't involved in literary clubs or garden clubs in the community, but she loved gardening. Her favorite pastime was to get out and work in her yard. And due to that, she won several awards for having the yard of the season, and she was real proud of that. When uh, mother was 89, she fell off her riding lawnmower and broke her arm. Now, Jean had been doing her yard work for several years, but 
there were about 12 leaves on her front lawn that she just couldn't stand being there. So she hopped on that lawnmower. And I don't know if any of y'all, or if everybody, I'm sure, you've never seen where she lives, but her driveway is just like this. And I imagine she got a wheelie when she left the yard and was hit the concrete and she got slung off. Well, Mother tried to tell us a story about what happened because she knew she would be on our bad side for getting on that lawnmower. But um, we believe she fainted because the first thing she could remember after taking it to the back so the neighbors wouldn't see her and tell on her was waking up on the basement floor. And um, she remembered that she had not emptied the grass clippings that were in the bags on the lawnmower. So with that broken arm, she gets up, she goes up to the natural area in the back of her yard and she empties both of those bins full of grass clippings. She comes back down to her driveway and my mother never put the lawnmower up without blowing all of the little pieces of grass off. So she plugs up the blower and she gets all of the grass off. And all of this time she kept saying, they're not gonna believe any of these stories that I've tried to make up as to what I did. So I'm just gonna have to tell them the truth. My mother loved staying out of trouble with us too. She loved the mountains. Every October, she and Daddy would go to Gatlinburg to the craft show. And after Daddy passed away, it'll be 27 years ago this Christmas Eve, Jean and I decided that Mother wasn't gonna miss those trips. So every October, we took her, had the best time. And the trips were always eventful. We always had hilarious stories to tell the kids about what had happened to us while we were there. We were just like Lucy and Ethel. And I called mother my sidekick because she was always involved in any of the projects that I had going. She was right by my side trying to help. And that's how she was with our entire family. She was very involved. She loved all of us. You could not tell where the blood relatives ended and the in-laws began because she loved us all the same. And Jean and I love you for loving my mother. Let us pray. God, we have learned to love from being loved by you. May we always remember to put you first as we follow Christ's footsteps, that we may know your love and show it in our lives. As we prepare for celebration of, of the celebration of Jesus' birth, fill our hearts with love for the world, that we all may know your great love for us all. Amen. The What's to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. No. Would you stand as we continue to sing this morning and just reflect on the goodness of Jesus? 
the miracle of his birth and how he invites us to know him and have relationship with him. I'll sing, oh, come all ye faithful. Oh, come all ye faithful.
Jesus, we praise you today for you alone are worthy. Lord, you deserve all of the glory. Lord, help us to live lives that walk worthy of the gospel that you have called us to. Help us be love to the people around us. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you are God with us. You are God in us. Holy Spirit, you are God in us. Lord, thank you for that. Help us remember who you are today and every day. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you can open them to 1 John chapter 4. And I will tell you that um, uh, you are pre-wired to know that during Advent season, the preacher is supposed to talk about shepherds and stables and angels. And I'll get to that in the next couple of weeks. But uh, I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to talk about something that obviously is... Um, is missing in, a, in many ways, as Glenn spoke of just a moment ago. I'm going to talk about love today. And today is Advent. You know, in Advent, we talk about the coming of the arrival of Christ. Christ has come. I mean, along with Christ has come this beautiful promise that there is a promise in the birth of Jesus. You know, his name shall be called Emmanuel. We sing about that. God with us. He is that wonderful counselor, that mighty God, that everlasting father, and that prince of peace. And it was all just kind of summed up in that one person, the Lord Jesus himself. And yet we know that arrival, that waiting, that anticipation, knowing that he's come and that he's come for us. We didn't have to do anything to earn that or deserve that. That he did that for us when we were the most undeserving people. He came for so that's what Advent's about. It's the reminder of the coming and the arrival of Christ. Last week, we lit the candle of hope, and we talked about the importance of hope and that in Christ, there is hope. I mean, despair is everywhere, but there is hope in Jesus. There is absolute hope in Christ. And that hope is secure, knowing that in Christ, there's that power that comes from being in Christ. There's that forgiveness that comes from being in Christ. There's also that unbelievable security. You know, again, as Glenn spoke of a, about just a moment ago, it would be a devastating moment for the Jemison family if there was no security in their life. And if they didn't have that hope of that security. And take it from somebody that's done 17, 18, 1900 funerals over my, my pastoral ministry. I have done way, way too many that people had zero hope. Zero hope. The only thing they could ever cling to was that he would give you the shirt off his back. That's it. In the book, that's not enough. There's got to be more to it than giving you the shirt off the back. There's got to be a life that's been changed. Because at the end of a life, it doesn't mean it's over. It means it just begins, right? It begins. Eternity is forever. We are secure in the person of Jesus. In Christ, there is hope. And there is life. And that life is in Christ. So today, I'm going to talk about love. There are so many things about love that are misunderstood today. It's almost as uh, misunderstood as a lot of headlines. That, and we can understand now why papers are kind of dinosaurs. Because I came across a series of paper clippings and, and headlines. And, and you can see confusion even in headlines. In fact, the first one is this. You see it on the screen. If you don't recognize there's a problem in that, Mississippi's not spelt that way. All right? The next one, if you don't recognize there's a problem at city unsure while the sewer smells. The city don't even know why it stinks, right? What about this one? Man arrested for everything. Everything. What about this one? Homicide victims rarely talk to police. <laughs> what about this? Statistics show us that teen pregnancy drops off after age 25. <laughs> really? 
This is kind of crass. One armed man applauds the kindness of strangers. <laughs> Scientists who kill ducks to see why they're dying. That's a headline. And then there's this one Ten Commandments. Supreme Court says some okay and some not. You know, confusion. We live in a world filled with confusion. We live in a world that don't even begin to comprehend what is love. What is true love? What is real love? What is love that will last a lifetime love? Not that, you know, watery-eyed, weird look that happens when two people make a pledge to each other. But what is it about love that, that will help you get beyond the honeymoon and get throughout your life? What is it about love? Well, our world today is confused with love. The world today is starving for love. In fact, I, I want you to think of this. I love you. I mean, that's a, that's a beautiful phrase. I love you. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Those little old bitty phrases mean a lot. I love you. Can I tell you, there was a virus that happened in the year 2000, in the spring of the year 2000, that swept all over, all over the world in a matter of just a few hours. You know what that virus was called? It was called the love bug. It swept all over the world. Now, it was not a virus like COVID. It was a computer virus. That's all it was. It was a computer virus that, that originated in Manila in the Philippines by a 24-year-old guy that was broke. He had no money. He thought he would come up with, a, with a, a, a virus that he would send out to 50 people and in, in turn that they would crypt their computers and he would be able to rob them a password so he could be able to do things, get some money for himself or maybe pay for school or finish school. So he sent it out, thought it would just stay within the 50. Well, those 50 computers affected everybody in the contact list. In a matter of a few short hours, the Pentagon was shut down. The CIA, the FBI, Homeland Security, all that the, uh, uh, was shut down. The parliament was shut down. And it was shut down because of a virus. Well, let me tell you something. Just because you got the email did not mean you got the virus. You had to click on the attachment. And let me tell you what the subject line was that he sent out. In the subject line, it says, I love you. And then the little attachment was a love letter. Can you imagine getting an email from somebody and you're working at the Pentagon or you're working at the FBI and you see that and you say, man, somebody must really love me. And then the next thing you know, you click on it and the virus takes over your computer. Now, what does that tell you about our society 20 years ago? And if it was bad then, man, it's way bad now, right? People are desperate to be loved. People want to know that they are loved. People want to know that people think about them. People want to know that, that, that their life matters to, to, to somebody else. They want to know that. For these next few moments, I want you to think about this. In Christ, like last week, there was hope. Today, in Christ, there is love. Beautiful love. In fact, when you listen to the Word of God, I'm going to read a few verses of Scripture to you. The Bible says, make love your greatest aim. You don't have to, it's not on the screen, but make love your greatest aim. 1 Corinthians 14. Matthew chapter, Mark chapter 12. What did Jesus say? The greatest commandment of all was love God, right? So what does the Bible say? In Christ, there's love. There's the greatest commandment of all. The, the Galatians 5 says the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. Galatians 5, 14, the entire law is summed up in a single command. What is that command? Love your neighbor as yourself. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, above all, love each other deeply. And when Paul was writing the Corinthians, he came to the end of it. 
He says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love that is not a feeling. Love that, that is not something that the world would say is uncontrollable. I couldn't help it. I just fell in love with him. You ever heard that? Have you ever been that person and said it? Man, I didn't, wasn't planning on it. I just fell in love with them. Like you had no control of it. It was uncontrollable love. Can I tell you, that's not true, biblically speaking. You choose who you love in your life. You choose to love them with your life. You make that choice in love. It's not some kind of feeling. It's not some kind of uncontrollable desire. It's not something like falling out of the bed or falling on the ground. No, no, no. It is a choice that we make to love. That's why when Paul was writing about love in 1 Corinthians 13, he goes through all of these things. And then he gets down to it. He said, man, if you don't got love, you don't got nothing. Because everything hinges on this thing called love. And it's not just any love. It's the love of God. The love of God. Three things real quick. First of all, in Christ there is love. There is love that changes us. I mean, it changes us. Everything about our life is changed. We are changed not because you love God, but because God loves us. I'm not changed because I love God. I'm changed because God loves me. He loves me. That changes my life. I ask you to turn to 1 John chapter 4 for a reason. Because John, if you know anything about Scripture, you know this. That John was the oldest of all the apostles. He outlived them all. I mean, he went through heck sideways. He was supposedly dipped in a cauldron of oil. He was supposedly exiled to the Isle of Patmos. He supposedly was in Ephesus with, with Jesus' mother. And, and he kind of oversee, oversaw the church in Ephesus. But John did not start out as a guy that talked about love. In fact, John's name in the New Testament in the early stages, he was called the Son of Thunder. That's his name, the son of thunder. Jesus called him the son of thunder. And, and, and John became a part of that inner circle with Jesus, with Peter, James, and John. And that was John. John, though, became known as the apostle of love. Later in life, the apostle of love. Why? Because 85 times... In the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation, he uses the word love. And you think about it. How does a man go from being called the son of thunder to be called the apostle of love? You can always make the argument that John must have really loved Jesus. I mean, think about it. Early on in, in, in his life, in, in Luke chapter 9, there was a day in the life of Jesus that they were getting ready to, to go into a village of Samaritans. And, and, and those Samaritans did not want to get, gain Jesus' access. And John said, hey, I'll tell you what, Jesus. Let me just call down fire and we'll burn them all down. We'll just kill the whole town. And then you go all the way to Mark chapter 9, that James and John, they're up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and, and they see the glory of God, and they're coming down off of that mountain. And, and, and John says to Jesus, says, Jesus, I've got something. I want you to give me what I asked for, right? I'm going to ask for something. I want you to go ahead and tell me yes. What is it, John? In your kingdom, would you make me sit right beside you in the kingdom? I mean, that's how the son of thunder was thinking. And everything you can pick up about John's life, you can understand that John obviously had love for Jesus. But something changed in John's life. When Jesus was dying on a cross, and all the other apostles had gone, and there was a handful of women standing at that cross, and John the Beloved came up there and stood beside those women, Jesus looked down from the cross, looked into the face of John, and said, John, behold your mother. 
And woman, behold your son. It was right then and there that John must have been overcome with the fact that Jesus Christ loves me so much that he would entrust me with the most valuable person on planet earth to him. And that would be his mother. He trusted Peter with the church, but he trusted John with his mother. And you can see that love of God in John at that moment took Mary and cared for her as his own mother and loved her. You know what changed in John's life? It was being loved by God. That's why when John wrote about that love, he wrote about words like this. He says, we love God because he first loved us. I could not love God apart from God loving me first. There's no way, there's no way in the world that, that people can truly love God the way God deserves to be loved without God, first of all, taking the initiative and loving us first. Because that sentimental mumbo-jumbo spiritual junk that floats around in most every family that you know, nobody's going to come out and be honest and say, I hate him. But their life demonstrates they hate him. They don't have time for him. They don't have time for his truth. They don't have time for his ordinances or his precepts. They don't have time for it. But yet if you press them on it, oh, I love him. I love him. The question is, does he love you? Because your life is only changed by God loving you. That's why he says, we love because he first loved us. God loved us first. We could not love him until he loved us. But God proves his love toward us that while we were even still sinners, that Christ died for us. When did he love us? When we were good? When we obeyed our parents? When we did right at our job, when did he love us? He loved us while we were sinners. God demonstrated that love toward us. That while we were sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. And when we embrace that love of God, everything about our life takes on a different meaning. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. You, you know, you can give without loving God. But you cannot love God without giving your whole life. And you cannot love God without God loving you. See, that's the key. It's that God changes our life. And what is the proof of that? It's that our life is different. We're no longer the same. Our life, we live it totally different. Why? Because we've experienced the love of God. When John wrote down verses like in, in 1 John 7 and 8, but also in, in, in 1 John 4, 16, we know and rely on the love of God has for us. John, he says, we rely on God's love for us. He reminds us of that. 1 John 3, 1, how great is the love of the Father that he's lavished on us. Verse, 1 John 3, 1, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. All of this is the love of God that's been poured out on our life. And the love of God changes us. We are changed. We're not the same. We can never be the same. I was coming out of a funeral home in Columbus, Mississippi this week. Lori's aunt had passed away and Lori was homesick. So I ran over there and represented the family and went to the funeral and sat on the back row, slipped out, and went to talk to the funeral director that's a friend of mine and 
And then I slipped out the side door, and as I was coming around the corner, I looked up and I saw a, a very elderly man with his wife, and she was either on a walker or canes, and, and he was helping her to the car. And I looked at him, I said, he looks so familiar, but it can't be him. I thought he was passed away by now. And, and he looked up, and out of nowhere, he said, my God, it's Billy Abrams. I left Winn-Dixie grocery store in 1977. And Emmanuel Betros was the manager of the store. I don't think I've seen Emmanuel Betros maybe since 1978. And I walked out and there he was and he recognized me. I said, Betros, how in the world did you know it was me? He said, I've been waiting because one day I wanted to see you because I knew how you used to be and I wanted to see how you are now because people have told me that your life has been changed. See, that's what God does. Billy Abrams in a thousand lifetimes could not stop stealing, cussing, fornicating, smoking dope, get drunk. In a thousand lifetimes I couldn't do it. I couldn't age out of it. Couldn't do it. Could not do it. But I tell you, God loved me. And God came and arrested me. That's what that next thing is. In, in Christ there is love. And that love constrains us. You know, that word constrain and the word compel in the Almond Christian Standard Bible says, for the love of Christ compels us. That word constrain, compel, those two words are almost synonymous. The word for constrain means that he takes over our life. In other words, he steps into your world. He occupies that space. He is the one that you've given up control of your life to. He loved you. And then all of a sudden, he constrains us. He compels us. He holds us together. He takes hold of us. This is exactly what happened to John. This is exactly what needs to happen to all of us. If it had not already, we need to be constrained by Jesus. Because a part of that constraint is that compel. Because the love of Christ, that love compels us. And it compels us in that next passage in 2 Corinthians 5.20. It said, therefore, this compelling, constraining love of God compels us to be ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. See, that's the compelling part of our life. We are constrained by God. We're loved and changed by God. And then he compels us to be his voice and his, and his witness in this world. We are ambassadors for Jesus. And as ambassadors for Christ, our primary objective is this. And as his ambassadors, we plead on Christ's behalf. We beg. We do whatever it takes. To cause people to know that there is a God that loves them and they can receive that love. And that love will help them to love him like he needs to be loved in full. You know, when Gandhi, history will forever record the name of Gandhi. But Gandhi as a young man, as a young Hindu in India, you know, he was a seeker. He was looking for Christianity. He showed up at an evangelical church. And one day when he showed up at that evangelical church, Gandhi got there and he was turned away at the door by the ushers. Because Gandhi was a part of the lower caste people in India. And furthermore, he was not white. And he was a low caste India, Indian person. Like it unto the Roma gypsies. You know, you can go all over the world and find Roma gypsies. And this is what you'll find out about the Roma gypsies. They were a low caste people in India that were forced out of India. They went everywhere as nomadic people, everywhere. For years, 
Every summer, one of my daughters and I, we would go to Eastern Europe. We'd go to Slovakia and, and Poland and Germany. We, we would go all over uh, that part of Europe, and we would work amongst the Roma people. Guess what I found out about the Roma people? They were hated. They couldn't even go to a church and worship because they were hated. Gandhi said, I showed up that day because I was curious about Jesus. And I got there and the usher turned me away because I was of a lower caste person and I was not white. And that Gandhi made that famous statement. He says, if it weren't for Christians, I'd be a Christian. Because he was so impressed with Jesus. But he was so put out by Christians. And can I tell you, not a lot's changed since Gandhi was a little boy in India. Because see, one or two things happen in our life. We either stand in the way of people coming to Jesus are we stand in the way with God in helping people come to Jesus? We are either in the way of or in the way with. And we cannot be in the way with until we know the love of God. Until our life is constrained by that love. And we're compelled by that love. That I cannot keep this good news to myself. I cannot hope on a whim that people will figure it out before the end. That God puts it in our heart to make Jesus known. And who knows what people will do when they hear that God loves them. The majority of people today that live within a stone's throw of this church or your community or your house. They know everything that Christianity is against. But I wonder how it would be different if they knew what Christianity was for. That we exist to help people to know God. To love God by being loved by God first. And to do whatever it takes to get that message out and let him constrain us. It's not you waking up with a, a good feeling about that day. It's him constraining your day. Him compelling you throughout that day to be that light. Him doing it. Not you, him. And you just surrendering to that love of God. There is no fear in love, John says. Instead, perfect love drives out fear. Because fear involves punishment. We love because he first loved us. Today, do you know what it means to be loved by God? Because only then can you know what it means to love God like he needs to be loved. The Lord said, if you love me, you'll obey me. The key to loving is obeying. You cannot obey without loving him. And you cannot obey and love him without him loving you. He makes that first move. What you do with that is you. Nobody, nobody can stand in your place. Nobody. But today, would you trust Jesus? 
Would you accept the fact that he loves you? And would you just simply say, Lord, I can't do this without you loving me. I want to love you and live for you. For the rest of this little life I have left. for these next few moments. Just make an altar out of the pew where you are. But I want you to listen to this invitation. And listen to the word of God, the spirit of God. And let God direct you.